Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome. Whether you've joined us online, whether you're here on our Greece campus or at our Brockport campus, it's really, really good to be here. Really good to see you. And uh, as pumped as we are, I know God is even more excited and glad that you're with us this morning. He does amazing things when he brings us together to equip and to strengthen and to build us up in him and with each other. And just uh, something a little bit about hope and who we are, if you don't know, we have got a great app to help you know what's going on here at Hope. You can get notifications around the areas that you're interested in learning more about, and it's a great way to share the messages that you've heard with friends that you've got. So if you haven't downloaded that already, there's a really easy way to do that. And you can see it on the screen there. You just text share the hope rock to 77977. It will know what kind of phone you have. Don't ask me how that works. But it'll take you to the correct app store for your phone. And then all you got to do is hit install. It is that easy. Even Pastor Larry can do it. Where's Pastor Larry? <laughs> but do that. Do that. And it's also a way to give. And for those of you who have been uh, so faithful in partnering with us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as of September, we ha are meeting our budget. Yay, God. Yay, God. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you so much for your faithfulness to that. Let's finish strong uh, through this last quarter. And if you've not partnered with us yet, you can see again on the slide there, there are five ways to give. There are offering boxes near the doors in both of our worship centers here in Greece and in Brockport. You can text 73256 to share the hope, to give. You, there's our app that I mentioned. There's the online give button. And then you can do the old school thing and, and send it in through the mail at 1301 Vintage Lane, Rochester, New York, 14626. And with that, we just, again, thank you that you're here. We're really 
we really are glad and honored that you're here with us. God does so many things when he brings his people together, one of which is he opens our eyes. He opens our eyes to the truth in his word, to, to what he's done for us and what he's doing in our lives. And here are just some of the things that the Bible says about what God does in opening our eyes. From Isaiah, And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. From the Psalms, The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. And Jesus' follower, Paul, he has this prayer that is part of really what we're going to dig into today in the letter to, to the church in Ephesus. He writes, I pray that your hearts would be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. And then from Luke, suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him him being Jesus. And that's our prayer for all of us, whether you're online or, or worshiping with us today, that we would recognize him. And this last one, this is the writer's plea. And let's make this our own this morning. Would you share this one with me? Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. Let's rise as we worship our God. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open our eyes, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. This is why we've come, we gather to be together in community, to be fed by Him, and to give Him him all the glory. Amen? We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our praise. We worship the living God presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the skies, descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord unveil our eyes, you're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing, open up the heavens, the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. 
Open up the floodgates A mighty river Flowing from your heart And filling every part of our praise Show us Show us your glory Show us Show us your power Show us Show us your glory Lord Ask him again church Show us Show us your glory Show us Show us your power Show us Show us your glory Lord Open up the heavens We want to see you Open up the floodgates Almighty river Flowing from your heart and filling every part of our praise open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our
Nobody beside you There has never been anyone, anything like you Nobody beside you There has never been anyone, anything like you Nobody beside you There has never been anyone, anything like you Bow your hearts and pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, th that is our cry of our heart. You are the one who des deserves all the honor, all the glory, Father. There is no one like our God. As much as we try to put other things on the throne of our heart, people, things, Father, help us put you in your rightful place today the glory would be yours. And not just today, Father, but that we'd live through our coming days, our weeks, having you on the throne of our heart. That when people look at us, Father, they would see you. It's amazing, Father, what you've done for us, undeserving as we are. And we acknowledge, Father, that we, we don't even deserve to be here. Father, forgive us for all the times that we have put something or someone on the throne of our heart. And Father, thank you for Jesus and the cross that makes today a brand new day where mercy and grace and forgiveness flow freely from your hand to all of us who just turn and say, I'm sorry. And then you don't leave us alone. You walk with us, you walk ahead of us, you walk beside us, and you give us each other to walk with. So, Father, we just say thank you. We give you praise this day for loving us beyond measure and for doing what we could never do on our own. So thank you. The glory is all yours. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, it is great to be with you again. It's been a while since I've um, been able to share God's Word with you, and it is great to be with you. I'm excited about this series where we're digging into the book of Ephesians, and today we are going to be looking at the last half of chapter 1, starting around verse 16. So I invite you to open up your pew Bibles or your device, and, and we're going to take a look at that in a little bit. But while you're doing that, I'm just going to do kind of a flyover of the book of Ephesians, okay? Uh, six chapters. 155 verses. You could probably read through it in about 20 to 30 minutes and get through it that quickly, but I hope you don't just get through it. The point is for it to get through you and to get through me and to allow God's Word to change our hearts. I'm going to be looking at a um, map of uh, Ephesus, where it is today in modern-day Turkey. You can see it is a port city. And pound for pound, this letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians is probably the most influential book in the history of Christendom. Paul wrote this book about 62 AD, kind of like Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, letter from a Birmingham prison, because Paul is actually in a Roman prison, and he is writing to the believers that he loves so very much uh, in Ephesus. He founded this church and he wrote this letter to them, but it's a circular letter. So it didn't just go to uh, the church in Ephesus, but other churches that were around that city uh, as well. And let me just tell you about the significance of uh, this city in the ancient world, okay? Because if content is king, then context is queen. Ephesus was one of the largest cities in the ancient world, about three to 400 thousand people. Uh, you're going to see a picture of the amphitheater in Ephesus. It could seat 25,000 people. Think Russell Crowe and Gladiator, okay? It was like that. It was a port city on the Mediterranean Sea, but it was also, uh, this city had, was a major intersection, four major trade routes, so people were always coming and going to this city. Um, also, it was 
uh, one of the wealthiest cities. You see here a rendition of the temple of the goddess Artemis. And because this was so incredibly popular and it brought in so much wealth, one of the largest banks, if not the largest banks, was here in Ephesus. So like the Caesars in Rome actually had all their offshore bank accounts, okay, in the city of Ephesus. That's how it worked. And again, like I said, one of the biggest attractions is, is this temple in the goddess Artemis, who is the, the goddess of uh, the hunt or uh, the moon. But in Ephesus especially, uh, they emphasized that she was the goddess of fertility and sexual fulfillment. And so part of the cultic worship there times was uh, with temple prostitution. So you can just imagine how the men at Ephesus wanted to be really, really religious all the time, right? The temple of Artemis was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. For those of you who like to count, there's 127 columns of this temple. So it was into this city that was obsessed with sex and money and power. Sound familiar? That Paul entered in to share the good news of Jesus Christ. About a decade before writing this letter, Paul went on missionary journeys. And uh, he was at Ephesus at least twice. It was where he spent the most time, more than any other city, in his travels. Uh, in fact, the, the companion chapter of the book of Ephesians, if you want to know kind of the day-to-day -day stuff that was happening for Paul, you can look at Acts 19. And it will tell you what he had to deal with. And there it tells us that when he first arrived in Ephesus, he found just 12 believers that were already there, very young in their faith. And so he had to teach them a lot. But there was just 12 believers. But that's all it takes with God. Give God 12 people who will go all in for him. And he can turn 12 people into like 2 billion people a few thousand years later. So Paul founded this church with these believers who lived out their faith courageously in a world much like ours. In fact, in the first chapter of Ephesus, we see Paul use the word for church the very first time. And by church, he doesn't mean a building. Oftentimes, that's what people think when they think of church. We think of church as a building, but the way the Bible talks about it is the church enters in to the building every weekend. You are the church. You are the church. So we're going to be looking at uh, chapter um, 1, the last part of it, and we're going to actually start at 22 and 23, the last part of the chapter, and then we'll work our way back. So chapter 1, uh, 22 says this, And God placed all things under his feet, that's Jesus' feet, and appointed Jesus to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Paul introduces here the concept of the church and he says it's his body. If ever you talk about church and like this, like, um, oh, I, I attend church, or they do, they do some really neat things at that church, you're totally missing it. We should always talk about church as we and us. All of you are part of the church, and we need all of you. Now, let me just speak for a minute to those of you who are watching online or listening online. I, I totally understand the whole COVID thing, and especially with cold and flu season starting up again. You know, when people have that to to not come in, totally get that. But if you're just watching online simply for convenience sake, not understanding what Paul is teaching here, the body of believers, we need you. God needs you. We need one another. We are the body of Christ. This is not just a metaphor that Paul is using. Christ is really the head and we are the body. If, people of hope, those of you who are here, those of you who are watching online, if you think that church is just something that you do once a week where you can see your friends that you haven't seen in a week and, and get inspired a little bit, that's all true. But you're missing the big picture. Paul calls us the body of Christ. You see, for Paul, it's always all about Jesus. 
even when he talks about the church, it's about Jesus. We're his body. There is, when he thinks of church, he realizes there's this mystical union. Again, it's not a metaphor. It really is this deep connection. Christ is the head, we're the body. There's something profoundly, deeply spiritual about God, God's church. And then this, God places his spirit into each one of us to do his work here on earth. That truth alone should forever change the way you think about church. The place where the Spirit of God has chosen to reside is in His church. It's how you experience His presence and His power. He has put His Spirit and His gifts into each one of you. Not just to me, but each and every one of you. And if you disconnect from the church, you're disconnecting from the power of God. Jesus is the head. We are the body. There is this life-giving connection. Just thinking about church drives Paul to his knees in prayer and praise and thanksgiving. People of God, we don't go to church because that's what we do. We gather together because that's who we are. We're the body of Christ. We are the fullness of Jesus who fulfills everything. That's what Paul is saying. That's why he prays over and over for the Ephesians. He loves these Ephesians so much, he just will not stop praying for them. If you love someone, one of the best gifts you can give to them is to pray intentionally. Pray for them fervently. In fact, really the book of Ephesians, it's Paul just breaking out in prayer and writing them down. That's pretty much what the book of Ephesians is about. Not just prayers, but like mega prayers for these people. Let's go to verse 16. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking, that means I keep on asking, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. See, Paul is saying, I can't impart this to you. I can't give this to you. So I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal this to you, that he will make this known to you. Paul wants everybody to know Jesus better. There are things today that you can experience from God if you ask. There are some things that you will never experience from God if you do not ask. Paul keeps asking that we would know Jesus better. I don't know if you have a mission statement for your life. About 30, 35 years ago, a very successful businessman gave me some great advice. He said, Kirk, you got to have a mission statement for your life. And this is my mission statement. To know Christ and to make him known. That's my mission in life. To know Christ better and better and to make him known to others better and better. We heard last week what all that God has done for us, how he chose us, how he redeemed us, how he um, adopted us. These, these wonderful things. But Paul says, if you don't know Jesus better and better, what difference does that make? All those things in verses 1 through 14, they're the doorway, they're the gateway to know Jesus better and better. So Paul writes this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That's what Paul wants. That's what God wants for us. For the eyes of our heart to be opened up, for us to have spiritual sight, to have the Spirit of God reveal what Paul just talked about earlier in chapter 1 to our minds to really know it deep in our hearts. See, Paul doesn't want us to just have information. He wants us to have sensation, to sense and know God's love and comfort and joy deep down in our hearts. And friends, if you don't have that, 
then you can go to church every week and you can see your friends every week and you will still feel disconnected from the head of the church. You can know about Jesus, but not know him, not have him. Practically, this happens all the time as believers because we're, we're fallen people, but we see this play out in our lives. If you have been a Christian for a while, you know the Bible teaches really clearly uh, that we, we the, kind of the beginning place to give God back um, from our resources is, is the tithe. The, the first 10% goes to God. We know that if we've been a Christian for a while. We know if we've been a Christian for a while that the Bible teaches this particular sexual ethic, which is true freedom and true fulfillment uh, only happens in the covenant relationship of marriage when it comes to sex. We, we know that. We know the Bible says that we are to forgive our enemies because Christ has first forgiven us. We know that. We know the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Worship God each and every week. We know that. And yet, so many American Christians ignore that. Why? Because God is just information, not sensation. We haven't had the the eyes of our heart open up to know this. As Christians, we need to, we need to, to ask the Holy Spirit to, to move it from our head to our heart. That's what Paul is praying here. This is what drives him to his knees, that we would know Jesus better, that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened. The heart is the seedbed of emotions and will. It's who we are. And this has to be a priority because then if it's not, it's just about rules and rituals and trappings of church. Paul says, no, no, I want you to know Jesus better because he's the one who can ultimately give us the things that we're looking for deep down, the security, the comfort, the peace, the joy that the world can't take away. It's what, what drives Paul to his knees, that you would know him. If you don't know what to pray for this week, you know, if, if like your prayers end after God protect me, God protect my family, nothing wrong with that. I pray that all the time. But if you don't know what to pray after that, go to these verses and just pray this prayer over and over. God, would you enlighten my heart that I might know you better and better. See, there are two words for knowledge in the Greek language. You can't see this normally in the English. Uh, the first is oida, okay? And that's used a lot. And that refers to facts data to know about something okay i know that last week the chicago bears played terrible and the buffalo bills played great i know that that's oida okay but then there's also genoiska and this is the word that paul uses here in ephesians and that word for knowledge refers to personal felt knowledge gained through experience see i might know oida that Krispy Kreme donuts are made of sugar, but when I take a bite of a Krispy Kreme donut, I gnosko it, you see? It's a big difference. I can know my wife has soft lips, but when I kiss her, I gnosko it. Very big difference. I can know a parachute works. That's oida. Very different than jumping out of a plane. That's gnosko. Paul is praying that you would gnosko Jesus you and know him, experience him more and more. Where it's, it's not just information, but it's sensation. That the Spirit moves the information to our hearts and we sense God's love and his grace and his joy and his peace. If you have gotten bored with Jesus, it's because you need the eyes of your heart open. Celebrities have to reinvent themselves all the time. Businesses have to reinvent their product all the time, and they got to come out with a new phone all the time. Jesus is ever fascinating. Jesus is ever satisfying. Jesus is ever fulfilling. You see, think of Jesus like a well, right? If you, want, if you want better water, you don't dig wider around a well. You dig deeper, right? 
we got to go deeper into Jesus and who he is to know him better. So what does Paul want us to know better about Jesus? The first is hope. He says, I pray that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened in order that you may gnosko the hope to which he has called you. When you look at the dark times throughout history, and I think we're in kind of one right now, you will see a lack of hope among people. When people feel like they don't have hope, usually bad things start to happen. Without hope, people grow bitter and cynical and angry and eventually can even give up on God. When hope is dashed, it leads to discouragement. And when we only have hope in temporal things, it's just a matter of time before our hope gets dashed. Now, we usually think of of hope in things. Again, nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, it's okay to have hope I, I, in things. I hope that my kids will enjoy their life and, and have long life. Nothing wrong with that. You know, I want, I hope that one day my wife and I will be able to travel and see, you know, like the national parks together. I'd like to have a lake house or, or at least use your lake house whenever I want. I mean, it's okay. It's okay to want those things. But if that's where our ultimate hope is it's just a matter of time before hope gets dashed our hope has to be in jesus christ he's the only secure hope and when you have certain hope in the future it changes the way you live today those of you who have kids or grandkids you know this right future hope changes behavior today when my kids were little my wife jody would say there is brownies for dessert But you have to eat your vegetables first. And so they choke down their vegetables, right? For the future home. Now, we're empty nesters now, so she says that that to me. You got to eat your vegetables first, right? Future hope will change the behavior right now. And the more we have unshakable hope in Jesus that he is really with us, that he's really coming back, It will change what we do today. We'll become much more intentional about building relationships with our unchurched people so that we can share the gospel with them, so that we can invite them to hear the gospel. When we have that certain hope in Jesus, we'll just parent differently because we know he is Lord. It will impact our relationships differently when we have that future hope. When we have that future hope, we know Jesus is coming back and justice will flow like a river when he comes back. So we're going to start now to bring justice into this world. Second thing that Paul wants the eyes of our heart to be opened more and more is your worth and your value to God. You might not see this right away, but it's there. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may gnosko the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. The glorious inheritance here that that Paul is talking about, I think it's different than what Peter is talking about in his letter when he says we have this inheritance that never spoils or fades. That's the inheritance that we get to receive one day in heaven. But Paul here is not sitting around thinking all the things that we will get one day in heaven from God. Paul wants us to realize how precious and how much we are worth to Jesus and to God. The inheritance that he's talking about is actually his inheritance. God has an inheritance coming to him. It's amazing when you think about it. I hate to bring this up because it's just the beginning of October, but Christmas is coming. And that means you start thinking about you're going to buy gifts for people. Maybe you have somebody in your life, maybe this has happened to you, where you're like, I don't know what I'm going to get this person because they like they like have everything, right? What do you get God who literally can speak anything into existence? You, right? He has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance. See, the one thing that God couldn't have that he was willing to go to a cross to obtain is you. As Leslie Newbigin says, to create the heavens and the earth cost God nothing, but to save us cost him his very life. Please let that sink deep into your hearts. Ask God, would you reveal that more and more to me? 
You are the riches of his inheritance. The God who literally had everything and who could wipe the board of creation clean and start all over decided instead to take on flesh and walk among sinful people and go to a cross and take all of our sins upon himself and be punished for him so that we could be with him forever. The cross says to the world, don't you see, even in your rebellious sin, how much you are worth to me. I did that so we could be together for all eternity. Paul is praying, oh, that you would see yourself the way Jesus sees you. You are the riches of his inheritance. It's like one day Jesus is going to say, Father, thank you so much for my inheritance. And he's going to be looking at each and every one of you. And to the extent that you experience that love and realize how precious and prized you are, it will transform your life. This is more than just information. This is sensation. When you experience that love from God and your worth to God and and get it in your heart, it just changes. God becomes more real to you. By the way, just a little aside, knowing this about God his love and your worth to him, that's what brings about true, sincere repentance. That's when repentance becomes real. See, a lot of people think repentance becomes real when we get scared of God as judge and his power. Not true. Paul says in Romans uh, chapter 2, repentance becomes real. In other words, it really changes us when we understand how our sin wounds the heart of our heavenly father and he still loves us through it all when we get that we're not going to want to sin against him again it's his loving kindness and how much we mean to him that brings about true repentance the next thing that paul prays for is god's power at work in you paul says i pray that the eyes of your heart may see his incomparably great power for us who believe That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Paul says, you want to see God's incomparably great power? Look to the resurrection of Jesus. Isn't it interesting? He doesn't say you want to know God's great power. Look to his creation. I mean, there is power, right? The power of God to say, let there be. He spoke and and there was. And he creates 3,000 billion trillion stars, each one putting out the same energy as a trillion megaton atom bombs every second. That's power. And yet Paul says it's not the greatest power of God. The greatest power is the power he exerted when Jesus rose from the dead. Friends, this power, you see, means in God's economy, through faith in Jesus Christ, you've already been resurrected. Through faith in Jesus, you already are. That's why death can't touch you. Yes, one day we'll be physically resurrected, but he's already resurrected you, and death can't touch you. If you see the future the way God sees it, it will change how you live today. Paul says, oh, I pray that the eyes of your heart would see what is already yours. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that even something as awful as the cross, God can work through. When Jesus was on the cross, when to all the world it looked like evil was in charge and God was not in control, yet through that cross, God flipped the script and he said, I'm actually saving you from sin and death right now. I'm actually assuring you victory and Satan's demise right now. And the resurrection proves that God can work through any cross. As Max Lucado writes, resurrection changes everything. Death changes. When death used to be seen as the end, now death is the beginning. Uh, The resurrection even changes the cemetery. We used to go to the cemetery to say our goodbye. Now we go to the cemetery and say, we will see you later. Death even changes a coffin. 
The casket is no longer a box where we hide bodies, but a cocoon in which the body is kept until God sets it free to fly. The resurrection changes everything. You better believe, if he can raise the Christ from the dead, he can do amazing things now in your life. God not only can make life come out of death, he can make something come out of nothing, he can make somebody out of nobody, he can take a person who is wicked and evil and turn them into a person who is virtuous and good and kind. That's what the resurrection proves. And that's the power that is available to us. God can bring life out of death through Jesus. He can bring life and healing out of the messes that we have made with our lives. God will not waste a thing, not a moment in your life. He will use it all for his eternal glory and for your good. Paul says, oh, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be open so that you would know the hope, so you know how valuable you are, so that you know the power. And here's why. He says this, because God has seated Jesus at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above, notice that, not just a little bit above, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Remember, Paul is writing to believers in the city of Ephesus where Christianity is a threat to the way of life. I mean, you read Acts 19, angry mob of people wanted to shut them up when they were talking about the true God, not the goddess of the temple. So Paul, uh, he reminds the Ephesians, look, let me, let me remind you. And so he writes power words and, and power verbs and, and dominion and authority adjectives. The right hand in ancient times meant power and authority. Far above all rulers and authorities. In other words, Jesus is securely on his throne right now, friends. And when Christ comes back, every person, whether they're a billionaire or a brilliant academic or a famous celebrity, the greatest of all people will not lift their head one inch higher off the ground than every other person because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's ruling and he is reigning, not just in the future, but right now. Paul wants us all to know that Jesus is above all rulers, all politicians, all geopolitical organizations, every league of nations, every multinational corporation, every CEO of every Fortune 500 company. He is far above all of them. But let's bring it down to a micro level, okay? He is above all your suffering and sadness, and pain, and false accusations that you face. He is far above that thing that has marked you, that you think will mark you all your life. He's far above all of that. Nothing will pass through his hands that he will not use for your good and for his glory, because he's far above ruling, and he is reigning. Paul says, I pray that you will be enlightened to see Christ is over all things. He is over the cosmos. He is over the world. But he is head over one thing. The church. The church is where Jesus bound himself to. Jesus bound himself to you. So you can have hope when all hope is gone. So that you can know how valuable you are and how much you are worth to God when nobody else thinks you are. So that you can know the power that you have in you because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that Jesus is ruling and reigning right now. And that he is in charge and no matter how chaotic things get, you can be at peace and rest. Oh God, that you would open the eyes of our heart. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord God, right now, I just pray if there's any people who are in this room or are watching online who have never received Jesus as their Savior and Lord, whose heart is still darkened by sin and by spiritual blindness, I pray 
Lord God, that you would open the eyes of their heart, that you would grant them faith. Would they just whisper to you, Jesus, would you open the eyes of my heart that I would believe that I would see? Lord God, we ask that you would plant your word deeper and deeper into our hearts that we would see Jesus. Holy Spirit, uh, capture our hearts. Where you, where you spoke to us this morning, where you stirred in our heart, would you call that to mind throughout the week? Bring it back so that we would live out of these truths each and every day. We thank you, Lord God, for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your church, the body of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship our awesome God. A mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? Could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings.
church, share that hope. Amen? Amen.